They just destroyed it. When they managed to capture this area, they destroyed all the houses. He was an unlikely warrior, an unlikely hero. One of the best, the most talented young surgeons in Afghanistan, he gave up a promising career in medicine to take up weapons and join the resistance, fighting to save his country. This is the house which I, which I was born in it, but it was Taliban used it in the later stages as depot of ammunition. Born and raised in the upper middle class of Kabul and Kandahar, the son of a respected Justice Department official, Abdullah was the fifth of nine children. It was green, it was full of flowers. Uh, my brother was uh, an officer in the army. He was a senior uh, member of the Communist Party. My family, especially my sister, like me to go to the United States and, and then uh, be with them and start uh, my education. He had to choose between guaranteed success and treacherous uncertainty. It was during, during that time, thinking in the bed, what should I do? One of my hesitations in going to Panjshir was that perhaps physically and mentally I will not be able to, to bear the hardship. I, I would like to, but you don't know. In fact, warfare would become his life, first against the Soviet Union and helping defeat communism, then against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. When I look back, being involved in two major events, the last event in the Cold War, uh, and uh, the first worldwide campaign against terrorism, not as a witness, but, but uh, somebody in it, that gives you uh, a sense of satisfaction to say. In a series of exclusive interviews in Afghanistan, the man known simply as Dr. Abdullah recounted the inside story of his 20-year struggle against some of the great challenges of modern Afghanistan. And for the first time, he would reveal his intimate dealings with the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, an outfit that had once scorned him when Afghanistan fell off the radar screen and he tried to warn of the dangers. In the absence of any diplomatic presence of the U.S. in Afghanistan, in the absence of any major interest in Afghanistan, we, we used to try to, to make our case, but we knew that it was a very remote case, unless some hard evidence comes up somewhere. Of course, the September 11th events were what caused the alarm. By the American invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, Abdullah was long used to fighting impossible odds. It all began with a David and Goliath story, the fledgling resistance, the Mujahideen, against the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. It coincided with, with Poland, uh, what was happening in Warsaw, in Gdansk, in, uh, in, in Lech Walesa, in, in those movements. We were thinking that this might be Good, if you, if you manage to continue to get the whole university uh, striking and, and demonstrating, perhaps the Soviets, the Soviets would, would leave. As simple as this. One day, I took a bus. It would pass by uh, in front of the Ministry of Interiors. As we passed by, I saw the lists on the wall. Later on, I learned that this was the list of over, over 12,000 people uh, executed. 
my brother-in-law, he was a, a senior army officer, but he was arrested after the coup d'etat by the communists. The commander of the prison, Sayyid Abdullah, was an infamous person, uh, which uh, everybody had known him for torturing the prisoners and, and taking them and executing them. When the Soviet army invaded in 1979, he began a double life. In hazy, smoke-filled tea houses, Abdullah and his friends conspired against the system. It was during that time that I started feeling that life was changing for the people of Afghanistan in a big sense. For the first time, hearing that uh, students from the dormitory was arrested last night, we don't know what, where did they go, nobody knew they, uh, what happened to them. Outside Kabul, the Soviet Union began a brutal war against the nation, killing more than one million people. In the mountains and valleys of the countryside, a resistance had sprung up. Starting out with antique British rifles, they faced helicopter gunships and the full might of the Red Army. There were a lot of people from rural Afghanistan there, and, and they used to talk about the stories of what was happening. Mujahideen in their own areas when they started slowly against the communist regime. That became my main, main, main preoccupation. My mind was clear that I have to do something. But his new life was brutal hardship. Hope was scarce. It's war. Whatever uh, uh, is the cause, whatever is the nature of it, uh, it's a war. Uh, it comes with all our violence and, and all that. It was never easy. Any death, uh, any loss as such. Uh, and you would feel it with, with the whole soul and body at times. The resistance leader he had come to follow, Ahmed Shah Massoud, the Lion of Panjshir, kept hope alive. Abdullah called him Amisab, the honored leader. He has been in, in it for years and years. And he is determined to achieve his goal, which was, of course, peace and independence. But he still remain a human being with its totality, not being affected. That's something, uh, something which uh, I should say that uh, a gift in somebody. When you have a leader before you with such qualities, the followers will, will get something out of that. War continued to rage in Afghanistan. The Soviet Union was defeated in 1989, but its communist puppet regime hung on for another three years. In 1992, a civil war then erupted until a new force, the Taliban, emerged and captured Kabul in 1996. And still Abdullah and Massoud tried to warn the West. These groups are, are there. And, and these, these, these are our enemies, these are your enemies. How come that, that you, you can ignore this fact and, and you can be indifferent to this? But no one listened, not even senior American officials who came specifically to see Massoud and Abdullah. As somebody in this part of the world, far away from, from the center of decision-making in this new world order, we knew here that Osama bin Laden uh, uh, in the situation in Afghanistan will damage uh, the situation in the United Of course, our first and prime con concern was our own situation, Afghanistan and the whole thing. But at the same time, we knew 
that it was such a potential threat to the United States. We could see this, but with, with all the resources, all the agencies and diplomatic presence and technology, high tech, <laughs> this was unseen. Perhaps I know some parts of the answer, but still I cannot, I cannot digest it. And visiting CIA agents offered no more, in Abdullah's opinion, making little more than excuses. Whenever Commander Masood used to meet with, with uh, people of the agency, his uh, first and last questions would be uh, U.S. policy on Afghanistan. Uh, and their honest answer would be that we are not policy makers. Uh, we are uh, providing intelligence and information, uh, and it will help. But uh, it's not the whole policy. The whole policy is much broader than that. The warnings that went unheeded began to come true, culminating 48 hours before 9-11, 2001. On that day, Al-Qaeda agents posing as journalists assassinated Massoud. When we come back, Massoud's death was only the beginning of dramatic new challenges for Dr. Abdullah. September 2001, the Afghan resistance leader Ahmad Shah Massoud was assassinated, and his right-hand man, Dr. Abdullah, knew the killer's motives. Al-Qaeda was calculating that with getting rid of Commander Massoud, Afghanistan would fail, Afghanistan, the, the resistance would, would collapse, and then Afghanistan will be in its totality under Al-Qaeda. Afghanistan would have been 100 times worse than Iraq, 100 times worse than Iraq, had it not been for that foundation. To give time to regroup and try to plan ahead, Massoud's loyalists first tried to keep their leader's death a secret. There were suggestions that uh, we should keep the news of Amr Saib's death uh, secret for another month in order to, to maintain the morale and in, in order to be able to defend. My point was that no, we should, uh, we should start uh, giving this news to different people at different circles and different levels, slowly, slowly, so the people will be able to absorb it. Two days later, 9-11 would change much and offer opportunity. Soon after uh, the second plane, I realized that uh, Al-Qaeda might be the suspect. Based on that, uh, the United States will react as, as long as there is this, this suspicion, there is this uh, feeling or belief that uh, Al-Qaeda is behind that, uh, Taliban will be, uh, will be under sort of psychological pressure. We should uh, try to stand up because uh, I knew that uh, without Commander Massoud it was, it was uh, difficult to sustain the resistance. His method, make use of the world news media that was quickly gathering in his territory, the north of Afghanistan. In days, he launched a global media campaign from New York to Sydney, from London to Tokyo. With charm, intelligence, and conviction, he became a constant presence on television screens around the world. He became the face of allies for the West in Afghanistan. After September 11th, any reaction by the United States would have been in Afghanistan, a vast country with rugged terrain and without any friendly force on the ground. The people were, were against Al-Qaeda and Taliban, but they were hostages to, to Taliban and Al-Qaeda. So we used to say that this is not just our enemy, it is, it is humanity's enemy, but nobody would believe it, but now you have the proof. 
His plan worked. The most influential members of his television audience included officials of the CIA. For the first time, they truly listened and took note. Within days of 9-11, a small group of CIA personnel, led by an operative named Gary, arrived in Afghanistan and set up headquarters in the Panjshir Valley. But they had plans of their own. Yes, now we, uh, we have come to, to work together with Afghans against the common enemy, and Gary mentioned about old times and the fact that Afghanistan was left behind and there was disengagement from Afghanistan, which might have led to what happened afterwards. But this is a new uh, partnership, new friendship and a lasting friendship, uh, and, and we will be together in this. Uh, and so on and so forth, and, and perhaps those mistakes of the past would be addressed one day, but this is the time to focus on, on what we have uh, against our enemy. Perhaps there was a thinking there that they will have to fight it throughout Afghanistan, perhaps district to district or province to province. What I wanted to stress was that the people of Afghanistan are against Taliban. If they see a light at the end of the tunnel, they will, they will help. Shortly after the CIA's arrival, the American air war began in October 2001. A small unit of special operations troops would join the CIA. I don't think that they knew uh, or they had a sense that Taliban would be defeated that quickly. So we had to talk about it. And we had this, these debates and, and discussions with, with, the, with those of uh, special force, uh, forces which were here and those of uh, agency. They were getting their orders from Washington or wherever their main basis was. So they have to pass those messages in the way that they, they, they were allowed to, because the broader strategy was worked out there. I got the square building, the uh, rectangle building to the northwest. Uh, one of the areas which, uh, which our intelligence worked with them was on the, on the targets. I don't think as far as human intelligence is concerned, they had uh, any other reliable partner. But the promises made by the CIA were not always kept. At the beginning, uh, their uh, promises of support were much broader than, than what would, uh, one would see later on. And leaders of the agents and their military counterparts often did not seem ready for what unfolded. They were mainly uh, facilitating for the air support and supporting financially supporting with, with the intelligence. There was the issue of coordination, uh, which I think they were struggling to get it. Uh, that was evident in, in, in some cases. I don't think that they had the ability to anticipate what was happening. Events would, would, be, would move much, much quicker than they had anticipated because their standards would, would be different. Their uh, circumstances which they, they, they were used to would be different. And the troubles had just begun, both great and small. The biggest problem, however, was a breakdown in communication. The unannounced arrival of British troops at Bagram Air Base, then the headquarters for Abdullah's group, 
nearly caused the entire operation against the Taliban to fall apart, even before it began. To the other leaders of the North, it appeared as if there was a secret deal between us and the Brits to bring their forces without letting them know, which was very wrong. We needed to maintain credibility in order to maintain support from the people. Who could have anticipated the consequences of such a clash? He had to go to the very top of the British government, speaking at length with British Foreign Minister Jack Straw. According to him, he said it was a mistake by our uh, defense ministry. That's, that's what, he, what he told me. Yeah, and it was, it was a big mistake. They, uh, and I made it clear to him that what I'm saying is not that you, sh you shouldn't have sent these troops. I'm saying that when you do that, when you wanted to do that, you should have let us know. Two plane load of them had landed. Other three were ordered to go back. Uh, they were in the sky for a while, in the, but it was around 4 o'clock in the morning here in Kabul uh, that uh, we agreed. So I had a struggle with, with our own people because of what had happened. This very big inconvenience, more than inconvenience, that, or, or embarrassing, that had caused. Uh, and everybody would suspect me, perhaps, that, that I, had, I knew about it and I wanted to, which wasn't the case. He still wonders if the right lessons have been learned. How many of our foreign friends here, based here, know the real situation in Afghanistan? Yes, still the gap. The man tipped to be a future president of his country worries about how things have gone wrong since the Taliban were first defeated. He speaks of corruption inefficiency, and a growing gap between the new Afghan government and the people. And he fears for the future. American helicopters take to the skies. As the fighting season returns along the desolate border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And war continues to rage in one of the most dangerous places on earth. NATO troops are pitted against resurgent Taliban rebels and Al Qaeda forces. But blood has been shed here and deadly political games have been played since Alexander the Great marched his army across this wilderness 23 centuries ago, since British armies faced annihilation in the 1800s. Today, the lethal games continue as the new rebels operate incessantly across the border from Pakistan and Pakistan's leadership is accused of deadly politics in the latest confrontation. Few know the story of the latest battles in Afghanistan better than this man, a former Afghan resistance leader, Dr. Abdullah. The establishment in Pakistan played this game for years under different banners, different cover-ups. A soldier turned diplomat he was named Foreign Minister of Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban in 2001. He soon began to see that mistakes of the past were being repeated with tragic consequences. September 11, the result was 7th of July in London. The result was Madrid bombing. The result was every one of these, these 
events were one way or another linked to that old policy, to the, to the continuation of the same policy. I think it has been more than enough of a price what we all have paid. We shouldn't be prepared to, to get more. And Pakistan continues its old destructive policies, Abdullah says, despite repeated warnings to the West. By the summer of 2005, Afghanistan's new leaders and Pakistan President Pervez Musharraf were talking publicly as allies in the war against the Taliban. But in a series of exclusive interviews, Dr. Abdullah reveals for the first time that what went on behind closed doors between Afghanistan and Pakistan was a very different story. Pakistan is playing it very cleverly, playing a game, not in terms of, 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 of real interest of, of this region. Without Pakistan's support for Taliban, 9-11 wouldn't have taken place, couldn't have taken place. There are many factors in why 9-11 happened. There was nobody who was from either Pakistan or, for that matter, from Afghanistan who did 9-11. At his embassy in Washington, D.C., Pakistan's ambassador to the United States is adamant, denying Pakistan supports the Taliban in the ongoing war. Incorrect. Incorrect. Absolutely incorrect. The denial is the basis of, the, of, of their foreign policy. Uh, and they deny it. It reminds me of the same echoes of the, the sounds of the past. By 2005, a new war was raging in Afghanistan. A resurgent Taliban working out of Pakistan launched daily deadly attacks on NATO troops and their Afghan allies. Antagonism between Kabul and Islamabad was mutual and headed for a showdown, which came at a top-level meeting in Islamabad, Pakistan in June 2005. The new Afghan intelligence service, headed by Commander Amrullah Saleh, had captured three Pakistani members of al-Qaeda in Kabul. They were charged with plotting the assassination of the American ambassador, Zalmay Halilzad. The arrests made headlines, but the reaction from President Musharraf remained secret. Dr. Abdullah reveals for the first time that Musharraf demanded the captured Pakistanis back. As we went to the room, it was very, very tense. Uh, President Musharraf looked towards uh, the chief of uh, intelligence, Amrullah Saleh, asked him that, uh, where are those Pakistanis that you claimed uh, that they had made an attempt against Khalil Zad. Um, he said that they are, they are with us. Uh, he said that, why are they with you? He said that because uh, we caught them. Abdullah says Musharraf then insisted the Afghans turn the prisoners over to Pakistan. They should be with us. Give it to us and we will, we will investigate. Do you have any proof that they were involved? And Musharraf continued to treat the Afghans like underlings. Abdullah says. It was like a boss asking a subordinate, the boss being very angry. He said that we should have them. But Commander Saleh stood his ground. He said that if my president says, uh, of course, uh, I'll do that. At Musharraf's insistence, Afghan President Karzai capitulated. Abdullah felt privately that Karzai was caving to keep the peace. In that top secret meeting, Musharraf then began berating the Afghan intelligence director for his claims that Pakistan's military intelligence, ISI, was still supporting the Taliban against Afghanistan. Again, in a very angry mood, President Musharraf would say that, are there proofs of ISI involvement in it? Can you prove through those documents that ISI is doing this? Or is it, uh, it's about training camps and so on and so forth, which is rubbish? No matter how much the Afghans cooperated, Musharraf was not happy. But nor was Abdullah. And then in one stage I sort of uh, uh, interfered 
uh, and I told uh, President Musharraf, Mr. President, uh, when we say ISI, it is the ISI that we know. We know from the time that they used to help us in the, uh, during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan against the Soviets. So we learned about their capabilities and, and what sort of an agency it is. Also, we learned about it a little bit more when they turned against us, when they used to help the Taliban. Abdullah says he did not expect the response he got. Yes, he said that we used to support Taliban uh, because they were our friends. I jumped and said that we are also your friends. He said, no, we are not there. We ought to be there. So that was very clear. That was from the mouth of the president of Pakistan, saying that you are not. We ought to be there. We are not there. For Abdullah, a feeling of battling greater odds was not new. He'd known that emotion for almost two decades. It was then that Abdullah, a medical student from the upper middle class of Kabul and Kandahar, first joined an underground student movement to oppose the communists. He graduated as a promising eye surgeon, but then gave up his career in the summer of 1984 to head into the mountains to join a resistance group led by the famed guerrilla leader Ahmed Shah Massoud, the Lion of Panjshir. <laughs> Abdullah went there for three months to treat war wounded. But a year later, in 1985, Abdullah knew he was there to stay. At Massoud's request, he turned the clinic over to others and began helping Massoud lead the resistance. From the very beginning, Abdullah saw why Massoud had such a loyal grassroots following. The soldiers knew, the Mujahideen knew, the commanders knew, and, and uh, there would be times that he would have problems in carrying out all the uh, plans according to, uh, to the anticipation or expectation, but he would always have a plan, a, a long-term, short-term, mid-term strategy. Masood was fiercely independent. This attitude led to confrontation especially when Pakistan tried to issue him orders. Their strategy was destruction of Afghanistan, while Commander Massoud's strategy was liberation of Afghanistan. So the two didn't match. The two mentality didn't, didn't match. What, one was indigenous from Afghanistan and for Afghanistan. The other one was uh, 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 outsider, uh, 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 of course, in convergence of interest with the people of Afghanistan, but at the same time with uh, ambitions much beyond Afghanistan. Even the highly publicized assistance the Mujahideen received from the United States and others often did not get to Massoud and his group, Abdullah reveals. They often had to buy their weapons on the black market. By the spring of 1992, the Soviet Union had withdrawn its troops from Afghanistan. A puppet regime left behind had collapsed, and the resistance, led by Massoud, had captured the capital, Kabul. It should have been a time to celebrate. It was not. When we come back, why it only continued to get worse. Spring of 1992 in Afghanistan. The Soviet Union has withdrawn. Communism has collapsed. Ahmad Shah Massoud and his men have captured Kabul. But it would not be a time to celebrate. It was then that Pakistan financed and unleashed on Kabul an arm of the Afghan resistance led by an anti-Western firebrand 
Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. Now a civil war erupted, and the fighting only grew worse. Throughout the early 1990s, Abdullah and Massoud tried in vain to warn and find help with the United States. But for America, the Soviets had been defeated and Washington didn't care anymore about Afghanistan. In exclusive interviews, Abdullah reveals details of secret meetings with American officials in Kabul. One meeting in particular with an assistant secretary of state in the summer of 1992 frustrated both Abdullah and Masood. I think we had also lunch together. She said that these, these are the words. We helped you during jihad. You failed your people in us by fighting against one another. Put in a very angry tone. Abdullah says Masood presented options and continued their warnings. His words are, are echoing in my mind. He said that, uh, yes, uh, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan uh, and the people of Afghanistan resisted and you helped us a great deal. Uh, but the result of that, that uh, uh, the outcome of that uh, uh, war was, was hundreds of thousands of people killed in Afghanistan. Over a million disabled and at least five million refugees in the country. Massoud then turned to geopolitics and basic decency to prove his point to the American official. In such circumstances, you left Afghanistan because the Cold War had ended and your enemy was defeated. In the United States, which was providing us with the stingers, today they are, uh, they are denying us pills, painkillers. So that we didn't know, that we didn't expect. We thought that there, there is something called at least moral obligation. By 1994, when Pakistan's man Hekmatyar was unable to defeat Massoud in Kabul, Pakistan created a new force called the Taliban, which in turn opened its arms to Al-Qaeda and over two years closed in on the capital. By August 1996, it looked like the end had finally come. After trying to run Kabul for four years, Massoud, Abdullah and their troops were driven out of the city by the advancing Taliban. Abdullah wondered if it had all been for nothing. But Massoud convinced him and others that all was not lost and they must never give up. It was a moment Abdullah would never forget. The battles against the Taliban would continue. Five years passed with the Taliban imposing its draconian rule on Afghanistan. Abdullah still fears that few understand how strongly Pakistan was behind the Taliban. It was, he says, that same old story. Denial as the basis or fundamental of foreign policy. Uh, when, they, when, they, when they helped Mujahideen against the Soviets, there was a flat denial of any support for Mujahideen. Yes, of course, for our brothers, we have sympathy. We were the brothers at that time. Uh, we have the sympathy. Refugees, how, how can? Of course, we will provide shelter. In, but we are supporting Mujahideen. We are training them now. Pakistan's ambassador to the United States insists that any help Pakistan gave the Taliban ended on 9-11-2001. But on 9-11, we were already mentally primed and sick of them. And 9-11 provided us an opportunity to really uh, you know, take a turn. We should have probably abandoned the Taliban about a year or so when they became incorrigible. By the mid-1990s, however, the war in Afghanistan entered a new phase with a tactic that had never been used before in Afghanistan, suicide bombers. It was a weapon that Abdullah could not comprehend. I just can't understand it. Uh, from what I 
I had seen from what I was raised with. Uh, uh, I know the meaning of Quran, uh, and it is uh, uh, it is not according to the text. It is not acceptable. It shouldn't happen. September 9, 2001. Abdullah was in India, about to fly to Paris in his continuing mission to get help, but he would never make it to France because this was the day that Ahmad Shah Massoud was assassinated. In the depths of despair, Abdullah had to fly home and find the will, the energy, and the conviction to hold the resistance group together. Abdullah was preparing for Massoud's funeral when on September 11, 2001, the enemy they had been fighting so long struck the United States. A new war had begun. Abdullah took to the world airwaves in an attempt to influence events as the United States and its allies prepared for an invasion of Afghanistan. I think it was important to reach the, the world leaders, the uh, international community, because Afghanistan was, was, a, was a sort of unknown spot to a large extent. I think the world was in need of of, of, of listening to the Afghans, and there weren't too many ways of doing that. I realized that it was needed to provide the world opinion with, with, with something indigenous from within Afghanistan and to give them hopes for the future of this country. By late 2001, the Taliban lost Kabul, and Massoud's men re-entered the city. I must uh, say it again and again that uh, it's a great challenge. Abdullah felt uh, he had to ahead. prove they had not come back to rule alone, as they had done in the 1990s. Abdullah's alliance with Kazai began well, but it would not last. By the spring of 2006, Kazai abruptly fired him. Abdullah believes Kazai's closest personal advisers, who did not fight in the earlier wars, were behind the decision. They think that it is, it is, uh, it is a heritage from their fathers, <laughs> what they are cherishing today. Uh, while uh, this has been, this has been uh, achieved with a lot of efforts, a lot of, lot of blood, in sweat, uh, a lot of lives, times, the energy, people uh, working 24 hours a day to, to pass one scourge of the history, the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Another period when, when, when the neighboring countries started to interfere. And then the, 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 the Taliban in Al-Qaeda. It, has, it hasn't come uh, uh, free out of sky. As Abdullah looks back on decades of struggle, he sees his own past with all its triumphs and tragedies, and he sees the hopes and despair of his people. He has few doubts that it was all worthwhile, but at the same time, he fears for the future. At the core of his concerns, the new Afghan government, which he helped form. Corruption and inefficiency are rampant in its ranks, he says and there is a growing gap between the government and the people. The people uh, were not under any illusion about, about the challenges or the opportunities and potentials which were ahead of us. But at the same time, uh, they, they were expecting uh, something much better than, than what, uh, what is here today. Continuation of the present situation uh, without presenting a solution to the people, and the people losing hope, that will be that will be a very risky situation. The only long-term solution, he says, is to confront Pakistan's old policy of trying to control everything that happens in Afghanistan. Unless the United States address the issue of Pakistan, addresses the issue of Pakistan in a black and white, in an outright manner, uh, the, we will not be at peace. And, and the interest of the United States will be in danger here in Afghanistan as well as elsewhere. 
It's a something which is happening on a daily basis. Can we stop it or not? If, we, if not, if the answer is no, then we should be prepared for the consequences, for the consequences of that. I'm very, very worried. Uh, because of Afghanistan, for Afghanistan, it's a unique chance. And no one knows that better than the doctor who gave up a life of comfort for the rocky road of Afghanistan.